All right. Uh, today is July 11, 2021, and we're going to continue our discussion on the Desiderata Extinction Nadi. And um, we'll go ahead. Um, Gary, you had a question? Yeah, I was just going to make a point which was uh, regarding um, the kind of carrot and stick that Hugh was talking about earlier in terms of getting people to take the uh, the vaccine. Um, but uh, uh, I think something Sophie said afterwards was just reminding me of one of those articles about Klaus Schwab and, and Davos and the uh, Great Reset, all this kind of thing. I think in one of those articles, I don't know if you remember it, Hugh, it had a, uh, there was a section uh, where s somebody remarked or it was said that uh, uh, that they're actually going to, to probably lean on the, the pandemic and, and extend it and, and use that as leverage to, um, to, to justify all the additional things that they want to bring in, you know, the, the, the uh, reforms of the digital currency and all this kind of thing, but use the kind of emergency uh, situa keep the keep the kind of emergency situation that we're in going for as long as they can uh, to to uh, enable them to to sort of slip in this uh, this other agenda along the way you know while everything is in a state of abnormality um, so you can see that there's an it, you know if you want to go for yet another conspiracy theory you, you know you've got um, the, the fact that the, in a lot of ways the pandemic has been very conven convenient for people who are looking at introducing those things. So yeah, that's not a conspiracy. Klaus Schwab is is on record for saying, you know, openly that we must use the pandemic for a great reset. <laughs> he, he he didn't make any bones about it. He didn't make any skull or bones about it. But yeah, I mean, they, it's, it's remarkable now that they don't even bother to hide it. You see, what there's been a trend over the last maybe 20 years that they've been more and more bold. And they get into the stage where they just don't even care whether you know <laughs> what they're doing or not. They, they say outrageous things and just carry on. There, there's no comeback. There's outrage is gone. Uh, there's, there's no such thing as uh, public resistance or you know, moral outrage, any kind of outrage. And so every, everybody's kind of simmering and stewing, and they just carry on. There's, there's no accountability. There's, you know, look, at, look at this thing about the lab leak, that all these... Uh, news outlets and that they covered all of that uh, that are uh, banned people that you know as conspiracy theorists that said it. now it's acceptable to say it and the Ministry of Truth has given that as story you know the the seal of approval. There's no comeback. There are no lawsuits against the you know companies that did the banning and stuff. And it, there's there's no repercussions. It's just astounding. It's just um, you notice astounding. it just in. Yeah, I notice it just in perfectly ordinary newspaper articles where, you know, you get the usual scandal about some politician or some person like that. And the whole thing is laid out in pornographic detail and everybody's tut-tutting about it. And it and absolutely nothing changes. Everybody just carries on as though it's just like, well, you know, this politician is as corrupt as hell, and he's involved with, with, uh, with you know, these all these relationships with women, and uh, that are all questionable, and 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 there's uh, you know suggestions of corruption left, right, and centre, and like the next day, they're just they're just everything's just going along just the way it was before, you know. So that was just a, like a little entertainment interlude, and now we're just, you know, that's over. But the people aren't affected. The government doesn't change. The issues are never uh, well. If the issues are followed up. It's it's still it's uh, um, uh, just nothing happens, you know. It's, it makes me think of like Andrew Lecter, yeah, we're, we're... Islands of the Lambs. Do you know when they're going to be when you know in that uh, that book about that serial killer, Hannibal Lecter, The Silence of the Lambs, where he describes that in the book, that's what happens just before the slaughter. 
There's a big silence. Nobody says anything. It just goes. That's it. And that's what I feel at the moment. I, I don't like it, but uh, <laughs> it makes me think of that. Hmm. Yeah, it's made, yeah. Do you remember the perfumer? Do you remember the, the perfumer affair you know, back um, in the 70s? In, in the UK. Mandy Rice yeah. Davis and Christine Keeler and all of that. And they, it was... You know, it, if you think about that, it was just a scandal of, you know, basically a minister sleeping with a prostitute and that, you know, Profumo was you know, a Russian, uh, Russian diplomat, was also sleeping with her. And that almost brought down the fucking government. <laughs> and today, it doesn't matter what they do. It doesn't. It doesn't even appear in you know next week's news. It's incredible how we've gone from one generation to something like the perfume of uh, to now. There's just nothing. Nothing matters. It's it's a masterpiece of um, of uh, um, you know active measures. It's basically you know Sarkov and all these guys. It's basically they they. They worked all this stuff out. So basically, they say if you bombard people with enough, they just get overload, and they just there's no more scandal anymore. You just you just debase the currency, and that that's we, we've got to it now. We're well and truly at the point where there's no such thing as a scandal anymore. I mean, they 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 just like mafia dons. They they obviously wiped out Epstein. They, they're probably going to wipe out Assange. There's you know it, it's they it's just like uh, you know. Uh, Khashoggi and stuff, just, 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 they just hoods, a lot of them, they're just criminals running the world. And, uh, you know, I, it's, I wonder if we are getting to a point where people will, will rebel. I mean, it's, it, it's, um, it's got to be close. Do you I think, think that, that they, um... they do run the risk? Or will we continue to just be desensitized and uh, not care? Because if we're so overwhelmed with all the messes all over, um, or do you think there'll be a point where the camel's back would break and people would actually rebel? Yeah. 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 Is that, see, the, the average person is, is the same throughout history. And what he shows is that there, there's a certain point where, where people just tip and then they go at you so you can do i mean it's like in indonesia so um you know i think the dutch were in indonesia for 600 years and they they took the piss over and over again and they didn't realize that they were building up pressure in the population when when the indonesians ran amok and just slaughtered them they were shot because you see the the perpetrators they, they don't notice because they're not suffering so they just psychopaths. So they keep on pushing the boundary and they don't notice that the pressure is building up, but the pressure does build up. And then it eventually, you know, like from the French revolution and stuff, it, it eventually it tips over the uh, Russian revolution and stuff. <clears throat> and then all the, all the establishment are kind of shocked. They, they never realized in the, you know, kind of little bubble that uh, people were actually building up, um, the pressure cooker was actually building up. I was thinking about something like that, uh, listening to that podcast, the Popular Front podcast, um, where he talked about the, uh, the ITS, the individuals tending towards savagery. Um, and, uh, you know, as you listen to that, um, at first, at first, it seemed shocking that they were just doing. He said they're just fucking doing anything. They didn't even appear to have an agenda. You know, they're, they're just going for it, like whatever they could bugger up and kill and shoot, and uh, that's what they were doing. Um, but you know, by the time you come to the end of listening to that podcast, you start to understand just what you're saying. That you know, you push and push and push, and, and these people have got no idea the pressure they're building up. Maybe not everywhere. But certainly, in some people, in some groups, they really are—they really are asking for a, you know, an explosive response. Um, you know, by the end of that, I, I'd gone from being rather shocked at this 
you know, even just when he said the name of it, I thought, what does ITS stand for? And then when he said the name of it, I thought, oh, my God. But then, you know, later on, you uh, you, you start to realise that that's not as I- irrational and, and um, um, oh, you know, gratuitously gory as, as, as you might think at first. So, anyway. Yeah, so I think the pressure is building up a lot on the right, particularly on the right. And the right has this Christian narrative and this kind of end times apocalyptic narrative. And they really feed into that more and more. You can see that that growing. But, you know, there's the, the something out of South African history. When I was in, in school, the you know, the the history that they taught us was uh, government propaganda. So they, they set the history books. And one of the things they said about why um, white people kind of deserve to own the country and rule it um, was they, it was kind of an argument that it was won in a fair fight. Um, so it was kind of, I can't remember what that argument is, but if you, if you have a war and win territory, it's considered an acceptable way of gaining territory in, and international law. So the same thing applies. Now, they, what they said to us was odd. And that's, they said that the reason why um, all the black people were impoverished and um, at, at, uh, in 1900 and, uh, is because you know, there was really a big rebellion then. And the reason, the specific reason why black people were poor and lost is because there was this figure, this woman who was uh, a cult leader, in fact. She was a priestess or an old kind of prophetess. And she said that she prophesied that uh, black people are going to rise and sweep all the white people into the sea. But she said as, a, uh, as part of the thing to fulfill the prophecy, you must give up all your pro- professions, burn down your possessions, burn down your house, and you know. And so, uh, I, don't, I think, I mean, it did actually happen. It's just the propaganda made it quite overblown and said it happened with millions and millions of people, which I don't think so. I think it's probably you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe. But they said that that's why black people are impoverished because of that. They gave everything up and burned everything they had. Um, and but it's 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 kind of interesting that in those times of rebellion, there's this common theme of cult leaders and charismatic figures coming and making you know, these doomsday predictions and having tremendous impact on a revolution. So it's uh, I think it really is time for for you know cults and cult leaders and stuff. And I think that is how a revolution will happen. They're, they're, you see, people people don't just run into the streets and go nuts. They, they rally around a charismatic leader that tells them to do it. Um, and so there, there are a number of figures, you know, that if the guys that get more and more popular, yeah, anybody from like Chris Hedges to, you know, a number of other figures, you know, they, they're not particularly cult leadery. But they can go over the edge. You, you can get one guy who just goes completely, okay, no more Mr. Nice Guy. And he goes completely over the edge and says, you know, pull the ring out. <laughs> and then everybody goes nuts in their name. Because the kind of thing is, you know, if so-and-so, who was Mr. Reasonable, said this is beyond the pale, it's now time for blood, then then people take that very seriously. So anybody from like Noam Chomsky to Jordan Peterson, anybody could could be one of these guys that just they just go off the rails. They could get long COVID and get you know become a COVID zombie and <laughs> go a little bit nuts, and then um, they would unleash a lot of people on the streets. So yeah, I, I think we should get ahead of the game and just <laughs> start start instigating it. Yeah, I'm good. I'm disappointed there's been a week without any comeback from from last week on on this very topic but yeah i can see there are more and more people that are starting to to get this i mean i found people on reddit that are saying you know 
I'm, I want to start a cult. <laughs> How do I do it? <laughs> it's, like, it's, a, um, it's amazing. Uh, you remind just talking about Chris Hedges. Uh, I was listening to a thing of his the other day. Um, uh, sorry, I don't have the name of it, but he was talking about, you might know these people, I didn't know them, the Reverend William Campbell and Fred Hampton as two um, um, sort of radical organisers earlier in the 1900s, I gather, in the USA. And uh, they were, uh, uh, one of them, I don't know which one he was talking about, were... Um, very much involved with uh, uniting the divided, you know, the black people and the white people, getting a, a, a united action in a certain direction. He was talking about the how the divide and rule had worked all together too well. Um, and, you know, the left and the right and the blacks and the whites had to uh, uh, find some way of coming together. I think one of the people who was talking about it, it might have been this Reverend William Campbell, he said was was um, uh, all, you know, uh, involved with, um, with black uh, issues and all the rest of it, but was simultaneously a member of the KKK. Uh, and he was... Uh, using this as a example of what what kind of extreme you've got a bridge to bring people together um uh and apparently this you know there was some uh success in this i think in terms of workers rights and that kind of thing um i'm just looking at my notes here but i, I haven't got enough detail unfortunately um, um well, there's a real simple narrative that it seems kind of golden to me in this in this day and age of uniting both the the right and the left. So, if if they divide and conquer, if they use divide and conquer tactics, which they they always do, there is a a danger for them for the establishment that that there's a new narrative that makes a different divide, and so they you can easily unite around some new narrative so so you know the divide and conquer is you know uh all shit happens because you don't vote for the right party you know and but if if the narrative changes and says no shit ha happens because it's all the humanists and technology um and it's modernity then suddenly you get a divide that's lateral that goes you know in a completely new direction and you know so so you can see it now with um the this transhumanist narrative from Allison and stuff is there are a lot of people on the left that think exactly the same way that that it's all gone too far and so then if suddenly the population turns and says yeah we we're sick of the digital world we're sick of digital control we, we're sick of transhumanism we say you know sick of all these geeks and um, all the billionaires all they're all technocrats and so if if everybody turns against the technoc technocracy, you, you unite so many factions. Because in a new narrative to say that shit happens because technology, and um, that can really backfire on them. So I think it's a perfect thing to peddle. I think it's a very, very good narrative to say that, you know, it's, it's all the fault of technology because I mean, uh, the best world in the world, people are starting to see now that so technology is not doing anybody any favors. More and more people are seeing that. And the, and with COVID and stuff like that, they, they've had time to think. And people don't want to go back to work now in the U.S. But, but basically, there's the, there's the highest unemployment ever and the highest job vacancies ever. <laughs> it's... it's completely polarized people are pissed off they don't they you know everybody's heard about your job and they're like you know every everybody's urban and then the service economy and so they're saying like everybody who's in the service economy has a bullshit job i mean the service economy is a byword for unproductive bullshit <laughs> and everybody feels that and they say like i'm not risking my life and risking COVID to go into an office uh you know if I, to I don't like it. I'm sick of abuse. I don't trust these people, and you know, more and more people are are feeling that way. So it's it's a gift to revolutionaries. And I think 
disruption is seductive and i think a lot of people got a taste for it um of the disruption and of suddenly not going away from home in the morning it's it it has it has had an enormous effect we don't we won't see it straight away but it's i think you're right and that chinese movement that you were posting about um on Reddit, we lying flat. <laughs> I think it's, I've talked to my uh, my nephew's married to a Chinese girl, and she, she I was talking to her about. She said it's it's going viral on all the Chinese social media. She said it is extremely popular in China. Lying flat, not talking about Japan because Japan is having an epidemic of those slow, you know, the sloth club and the slow movements. That's going on for quite a few years. Actually, it was more a reaction to psychological problems that young people were experiencing but it it is there we can't you can't deny it you know i mean and it's just well it's a generational thing isn't it it's it's a generational thing is that the the younger generation has been disenfranchised and they don't have any hope they don't have any hope in the old formula of prosperity that you can get educated get a degree get on the housing ladder most young people now don't see any chance of having a house they don't see any reason to have kids and they feel completely betrayed and so the the chances of them actually working for the system is getting low they don't know how to rebel against the system they're feeling kind of powerless but they you know if revolutionaries help them find their power they will unleash a lot of anger I'm pretty sure yeah, but, but it's a form of revolution and rebellion to do nothing too because lying flat and what these things have a profound rebellious tinge to them you know it's um it is a, it is another another tool you know it's just uh, okay i just do nothing oh it's the, it's the ultimate tool isn't it it's is strike so it's basically if you had a, a rent strike a debt strike and a wildcat strike <laughs> <laughs> the system would end. The, the system would end tomorrow. And and so it's only a matter of time before people do that. And so I I think that we should be preparing. I really hope that Faulty hasn't just like gone off reservation. Because and, and the it really R is R time to get... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but it, it really is the time. <laughs> Yeah, I, I kind of, um, it's kind of uh, frustrating because it's, to me, I can see a storm brewing and it's such an obvious time of opportunity and people are not seeing it that way. <laughs> people are saying, oh, everybody's despondent. Oh, these guys are so powerful. Oh, we can't do anything and stuff. And it's like, no, no, I don't see it that way. I think we're getting very, very close to the, the boil burst. You know? And so I, I think, you know, we should be positioning ourselves for exactly that. And, and the, the way it's likely to break is, you know, with a massive um, authoritarianism. And the way around that is secret societies and parallel markets and all of these things, which we should be doing, we should be developing. I mean, not, not the blockchain and stuff. <laughs> I don't think those, those have a, a hope. Um, because all the uh, all these countries are the governments are building their own blockchain, so they're not going to accept competition from Bitcoin and stuff no longer. And so, yeah, but all these Bitcoin zealots and stuff are, I think, are, are going to be disappointed. And but I've I've made real enemies from Bitcoin zealots who because. They say, oh, no, it can't be shut down and stuff. And it's like, that's fantasy. It can be shut down in a heartbeat. Or, well, I say, <clears throat> so all you have to do to shut it down is to say, if you use Bitcoin, it's a felony. So like, but it's nothing to do with the technology and blockchain and how you can't <laughs> defeat it. So of course you can defeat it. You just terrorize people into not using it. So it's like easy to defeat it. But you know, geeks, geeks always think in terms of problems that they can solve technical problems and they make everything technical because they can solve technical things. But that's not the way it rolls out. It's human and it's uh, psychology and, po and politics, it's psycho human psychology and politics. So they're always blindsided by the human element. But, um, and so 
yeah, the blockchain and stuff, they're not thinking in terms of um, it, the human element. It's just, they just terrorize people into not using it. But is, I, I'm getting increasingly concerned that I, I can't seem to communicate what seems so obvious to me. And when, you know, I feel like everybody's missing the chance of a lifetime. Or, you know, or, or the, like, anarchists and all these revolutionaries and stuff they have their heads so far up their ass you're saying like you're saying oh there'll never be an anarchist revolution like, no <laughs> the chance of a of you know of centuries is coming and uh, and people are just just can't see it i don't know how to communicate it i mean do you think something drastic needs to happen i mean i don't know the pandemic seems already drastic enough um, these climate events, but I don't know what else it takes. Does it take more bodies? Oh, floor, war. Um, war. 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 That's a good one. Yeah, yeah well, where we're heading for is <laughs> war. Because, but you see, you see what, what they're doing is the, the next crisis is uh, there are two crises coming. And one is, one is famine. And you can see that with the food prices rising all over the world. And the, the other is a, a fiscal crisis. So the fiscal crisis looks deliberate. It looks engineered to me. They, they, certainly at Davos and, you know, what these guys seem to be doing with the financial great reset uh, is it's a deliberate effort to wipe out fiat currencies. So everybody goes, you know, oh, you know, well, the, there's going to be hyper stagflation and stuff. And it's like they're not looking at the obvious. There's a... It, if the if the Fed is, you know, the Fed cannot be as dumb as it looks, basically. So everybody looks at the Fed thinking, you know, well, they're completely against what every investor and everybody in the market knows. I say, yeah, what are the chances of that? <laughs> I think that they should assume that the Fed's a little bit smarter than that, and the Fed is deliberately wiping out the currency. And so, so you, you can see from there how quickly you can get on to, you know, it's a debt jubilee. They, they have to have a debt jubilee. And the, uh, uh, inflation is, is a way of wiping out debts. So they are the creditors. The banks are the creditors. They are the guys that own the debt. And they all, you know, the guys at, at the BIS and the, at Basel and stuff like that, they are, they are the creditors. So if the creditors are wiping out the currency, it means that, uh, you know, they as the debtors would be the ones you think would, you know, want a strong currency. So the fact that they're doing this must mean that they have some other plan. And the, that plan is obvious. It's, uh, it's digital currencies, because digital currencies will give micro control. If, you, if everything is e-money on the blockchain, they can control human behavior in a tiny, tiny grain, it, it, at a level that's unimaginable. They, they, the, the social engineering that you can do with nuds and prods, and in particularly with poor people and uh, people that, you know, the large surplus population that is probably going to be on, on a UBI or social welfare. The, those social welfare payments can be controlled to a micro level so that you can't rebel anymore. If you rebel, it would destroy your social credit score and stuff like that. The same kind of thing as China. I think they envy the guys in China and what they've achieved in China. So, so what they, so they, they liable to wipe out the currency uh, just because everybody needs a, a debt jubilee. They, they basically, it's a, it's a way of doing a big reset. A financial great reset means that everybody is just, you know, uh, it goes to zero. So, and you can see, you can see the insiders know it because they're getting into fixed assets. So they're getting into land and they're getting into stuff that can survive the crash of a fiat currency. So, you know, you can see it unfolding before your eyes, but nobody's really <laughs> looking I've actually, I've actually received messages from in Ireland uh, today um, from various people, and especially one that's quite in the know, that's telling me that there's a pile of people who are buying vast amounts of land and properties without even visiting them. 
at any price. Yeah. It doesn't matter. All over, and all over the world. Yeah. Over the, it's happening all over the world. Yeah. Yeah. Without, they just, okay, but it's the same. Right. But it, you, you see, it, it, you see it all over in, in like any kind of uh, fixed assets. So art, art treasures, um, any kind of land, any uh, gold and sort of precious <laughs> metals and stuff that uh, people, yeah, people, the people will, um, will, will get into those um, because basically they, it's by more republic things. Those, those things will survive handsomely. Hugh, can I jump in there? Um, yeah. Can I, can I, can I, uh, Albert, um, where you were talking about uh, uh, just now and also just a couple of minutes ago where you were talking about uh, how uh, Bitcoin will be uh, pushed aside because the, um, the nations will just develop their own digital currency system and make the anything else illegal or criminal or the rest of it. Um, uh, and uh, I was thinking about something that, that uh, was in one of the videos. Um, now, I don't know if it was Mario or um, maybe that other fellow. What's his name? Maloney. I, I, one of those videos like that. Mike Maloney. And they yeah, Mike, Maloney. Mike Maloney, yeah. Th they referred to, uh, I think it was um, the 1930s in the USA. I'm not sure that I'm remembering this correctly, but it was where the government was trying to collect all uh, as much uh, silver and gold as they could um, to, uh, to I suppose, to back the currency with. And they were making it illegal for private citizens to have hold silver and gold. And the penalties were very, very severe. Um, and people were being forced to cash it in, to surrender it to the government for fiat currency. Um, and uh, I'm just uh, thinking of that um, uh, in two perspectives. One is that that there they were. There, there, here you are saying, well, they're going to make probably can make Bitcoin illegal. Uh, but we've got here precedent for making actually fixed assets illegal to hold as well. Um, and uh, I'm, I, yeah, I'm just sort of wondering about that because, you know, these people who are hoarding lots of stuff and, you know, it, it, if they say, well, that, that's just illegal to trade, you you know, uh, you're not going to be able to use it. Are they going to be caught out in just exactly the same situation? Yeah. So they, they made it illegal um, to hold any species. Um, uh, and in in gold, so you couldn't own bullion, um, and then they fixed the price of gold at thirty five dollars an ounce, um, and it stayed that way till nineteen seventy one, when they completely went off the gold standard. When they went off the gold standard, then there was no reason to to regulate gold. But the the guys, you know, the guy, sort of like Astors and, and all those rich guys of the time. They made huge fortunes out of gold because they took it offshore. They basically they they bought gold at thirty five, um, you know, thirty five dollars, and smuggled it <laughs> overseas where where there was no you know where got you where you were allowed to own gold and uh, basically it was free floating on the market. So it it was an extraordinary uh, theft of of assets. Yeah, they'll do that. They'll do that too, um, so yeah, that that almost certainly will will happen at some. If if the currency, you know, if there's hyperinflation, they they for, they are forced to do that in in a lot of ways um, because other, otherwise there's a big wealth transfer to people that have have gold and stuff, and the the governments don't. It looks like you know the U.S. is uh, and and Britain have spent all their gold, <laughs> they will pass it out. So, uh, you know, and, and... What about all those guys on Wall but, Street Bets and uh, Silver Squeeze and all these guys who are, who are piling up silver and gold and all that? So what's going to happen to them? I don't understand why they're doing it. So because if they Well, are, I keep on encouraging people to do it. Yeah, I keep on encouraging people to do it because they're, you know... Uh, 
the, the currency first has to inflate. And so it's been inflating tremendously, but I mean, for, for hyperinflation, it takes a while. So in that time, gold and silver are going up. You have to get out of gold and silver before they make it illegal to hold it. At, at some stage, the currency becomes like the Zimbabwe dollar. And then, um, you know, then they will try and seize gold. They'll, they'll try and make you... Um, make, so there are some differences before 1935, and that was... So the differences today are that uh, we have a sort of a Cold War. We are, we are in Cold War II, and China has a lot of gold, and so does Russia. So the, you know, they have a vested interest in having gold tradable and not a fixed price. And so they, you know, you could always take gold and sell to some place where China's dominant or Russia's dominant in a Cold War situation. So the, the thing is, um, you, you have to be able to smuggle gold, and that's, that's not easy for the average show to do. But if you have a boat, you're in pretty good shape. <laughs> By the way, they did all this in South Africa. <laughs> they, um, I'll tell you another reason why not. Yeah, okay, so anyway, um, in South Africa, they did, did the same thing. They had currency and exchange controls. So they have to do currency controls. It's very easy to do currency controls um, with uh, crypto because basically you can, you can just make uh, certain transactions illegal. So they, they're already doing that, by the way. They, they already have currencies in their back pocket that, that where, where they can... Uh, disallow you from, say, using them on the dark web and stuff, because they they, um, they can disallow people from using, certain specific people from using them, and they can disallow certain trans types of transactions, so they can stop you buying weed or something like that, whatever they choose, if they if they have the, the cryptocurrency. They can make those kind of, kind of things, where you have to say what it is you're trading, and then you have to say whether it's legal or not, you know. So, so yeah, they did all of this in South Africa um, and during apartheid because as soon as there were sanctions, everybody knew that the rand was going to fall tremendously. And so they tried to get their money out. So to stop them getting money out, they did exchange controls. Now, what happens when you do exchange controls is everybody tries to smuggle money out of the country uh, to, to preserve their wealth. And what, I mean, Anybody during the 80s that went on holiday in Europe from South Africa, I did it myself. You went, we were in, and basically you fill your shoes with gold coins. And we used to go and just test it, get a metal detector and see how many coins you could do until the metal detector went off at the airport. Because if they, if they caught you, then they'd confiscate it all. But anybody that... You know, as as a teenager, just going to Europe and stuff, and then people said, "Oh, you know, here, take these coins. <laughs> have to take all these gold coins for people." But we, uh, the famous thing was to to get a boat and to put gold. I I knew some people that built built a boat with a gold keel, and um, and and sailed it out, but. It'd be tremendously dangerous if you like hit a rock or something. <laughs> it's like the gold kill goes down. But yeah, the other thing is to get an asset like an aircraft. So they would buy aircraft and then fly them out of the country and sell them again. And then those would. This keep sounds like that well. story of. Um, this sounds like that story of Elon Musk and the emerald mine. Mine. The um, his father had a plane and um, flew it out you know, and sold it at great profit. Uh, but Elon yeah. was busy selling that's, their that's precious that's stones from their mine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah so also diamonds. Africa. Diamonds are very easy to smuggle. The, the sale of, of precious stones in Africa, it's like you're talking about, I mean, you're talking about chewing gums. Like it's just going, every, every person in Africa is smuggling precious stones outside the country. It's a, it's a trade that's even encouraged by by religious um, religious groups in the Congo, in Angola, in South Africa, and everywhere there's you got 
precious stones. They, they're selling to the Arabic Peninsula. They're taking them to China. And your only run of the mill guide, you know, your missionary or preacher is traveling with his suitcase full of diamonds and it's, it's going on for years. It's, uh, I, I came across a case that I had to look after for medical reasons. Right? And the story was, <laughs> it's just, it was, <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Smuggling in a condom, condom up the ass. Yeah. <laughs> condom up the ass is the way that you smuggle diamonds, by the way. <laughs> I think um, uh, I was just thinking about the situation here because, you know, a, a lot of this too, you've got, uh, like in most continents, uh, you've got different countries and you've got overland routes which give you options, you, you can travel there. Um, but, you know, in a place like Australia where it's just one homogenous blob, there's only one nation and the only way to get off it is on a boat in that in that, in that uh, scenario and the next nearest place is a long way off. Oh. Um, you know, uh, you've got a different oh, no, no, situation. The rich make out like bandits. No, the, the rich Oh, really the rich, like yeah, well, of course, they always will. But I mean, the rich they, they kind of like bandits mean. because they have private planes and, yeah, yeah, yeah basically every yeah. time your private plane takes off, and go yeah. somewhere, you make sure that it's probably filled to the gills. And now the, the <laughs> customs don't give uh, super rich people much trouble. So, yeah, I, I tell you, the, just just a, a, just a wee, you know, at the place I was wintering at here in Greece, this, this boat comes in from Albania. It's one of these cigar boats that it, it does 160 miles an hour on the water. And these Basically, it, it pulls into the marina. It has three people on board. They're just two young kids, just this this guy and a uh, young guy and this young girl. And then this older guy who was obviously the boat driver, kind of the, the – obviously, he was kind of like the security guard kind of guy. And he comes ashore with this, with this kind of suitcase – and they go to the bar, have coffee and stuff, and then, you know, he comes back about an hour later, and then they go off in the boat at, at 160 miles an hour. And they, they're going all to Albania. And so they do it regularly all the time. And I said to the guys at the marina, I said, you know they're running drugs, right? <laughs> and they didn't. They're like, of course they're running drugs. What do you think is going on there? They have a boat that, like, the Coast Guard, can, the, the top speed of the Coast Guard vessels is, like, 40 miles an hour. There's no way they're going to catch them. They, they, the guys don't pass through passport control. <laughs> it's not, it's, they just do it with impunity. And so, yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, a very good time to be rich. You're reminding me of something because... Uh, Due to the uh, pernicious effect of Lord Hugh, I'm often awake in the middle of the night. And um, uh, it just sometimes I've been uh, outside, the, uh, the toilet is outside, and sitting there and thinking, it's like 1.30 a.m. in the morning and there's a curfew on the, the, the airport around here. I mean, there's no flights after 11, between 11 and p.m. and 6 p.m. Um, but I was noticing that night after night there will be this plane go past, just this just solitary plane just appear out of nowhere. And I thought, where the hell does this thing come from, and what what secret mission is it is it on about? And uh, I think it might have been you or somebody put me onto the app uh, for Flight Radar. I think it's called where you can um, oh, identify okay, what these yeah. flights are. Yeah, flight yeah. tracker. So I had a little bit of fun with flight tracker. And this plane that goes past regularly is a private jet service, obviously for extremely wealthy people. Um, and it can be hired. Uh, it's set on their little uh, notice area. It can be hired out uh, uh, by uh, private individuals or enterprises and corporations and government departments. Um, and I thought, look, basically it's some kind of – it's on – Obviously, on some kind of you know highly questionable mission, 
uh, in the middle of the night, why the flight has to be made in the middle of the night. And it was, wasn't going overseas. It was just going to some other place in, in the country, which made it even more curious in a way. Um, but, yeah, you just uh, reminded me of that, talking about the cigar boat. You know. Yeah, so, so a large part of all the drugs being around the world are the CIA. So I told you that my, my, I got this friend who, who flew for the CIA. <laughs> Basically, he was a mule for the CIA. And they, they yeah, they, um, if you ever see a, a white plane, like a, a private jet, it's kind of like a, a pastel color and no markings, you know damn well what that thing is doing. Uh, so, yeah, I, I wasn't kidding when I posted on Max Ahmed about uh, pulling out of Afghanistan. They really are going to have, the, the, the CIA is going to have to take a big hit on their revenue. They'll have to find revenue from somewhere else. Because they, they yeah, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's a, they, they, you know, most of the drugs on the street in America have been funneled by the CIA. It, there's, there's plenty of stuff that's been exposed that, from the 60s that they they made a deliberate uh, pandemic of drug use in particularly in the city inner city areas and they, they knew that it would all be you know black people and stuff so it's a kind of a eugenics program that they were selling drugs internally in America it's population control and so yeah it's, it's I'm kind of amazed that liberals don't know all of this stuff and if you if you tell them, then it's all, you know, head exploding, you've got a tinfoil hat, and, you know, they all blame it on you. But is, is it's not the, really very hidden very deeply. No, I mean, because uh, you put up, uh, I can't remember, it's just something on Reddit recently where we exchanged a comment about how the Liberals' heads were going to explode at this, something like, you know, maybe I've just lived in a sheltered little burrow for too long, but I have trouble believing that they're actually that far gone. It, 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 they really just can't get their head around. Well, like, for instance, I think it was that one, uh, the video of that guy uh, talking about, um, you know, if he's bra on and his long hair. What was that one about? I've forgotten now. You know, I listened to that through and I thought, that was pretty mundane, especially compared to the one he'd done before about the Tesla cars, which was a bit, confronting to anyone with an ego. Um, but I, I genuinely had trouble accepting that, that people would be really challenged by by what he was putting forward there. Just I thought, fuck, are they, are they just really so far off with the fairies? Is it really that bad? And is it really that JP? widespread? Are you talking about JP? Sorry? Are you talking about that YouTuber, I, JP, who did the one yeah, on, yeah, the, did the YouTube. on the test? Yes. Yeah. That way, yeah, I, I found yeah. your exchange there, yeah. And he, he, what he's saying is absolutely mm. obvious, isn't it? It's just. The... <laughs> but that's what I thought. I, th yeah. I thought that there are really people who can't can't get their brain around this, even if they don't quite uh, uh, agree that they can't at least hold it in their mind and think about it a little bit without going, you know, into some kind of dreadful um, reaction. Uh, uh, it it yeah. was almost as though I, I was go on, sorry, Hugh. Yeah, yeah if, if I cross post any of those kind of things to Extinction Rebellion, they get downvoted to oblivion. You can see that there's the psychological reaction is, is it's extreme, it's visceral. And it very, very mild stuff. That's that's factual. It's it's actual. You know, you can see that they just don't want to look at it. Yeah. But the, there's, uh, yeah, the liberals don't do conspiracy. It's it's like a dysfunctional family where they all know that the father's an alcoholic and he's abusing the kids and stuff, but they will not talk about it. It's it's kind of uh, it's R.D. Lang thing. It's like nobody will say, you know, they walk around this elephant in the room and nobody will criticize the, the, or finger the problem or talk about it. And they all know it's going on. In all abusive households, that, that's what happens. And we're living in an abusive household. Yeah. So our, yeah. our leadership is, is abusing us. And, and no one will, will talk about it. Because just think how, what a big 
ask it is for to ask a house slave to you know to to accept that it is actually a plantation when they you know the whole world view yeah. you know, yeah. is, is is revolves around them not not uh, accepting it as is what it is so but you know you have to think in terms of they have to go back to their schooling and they have to say all the people they trusted like all you know the all the fond memories they have of Miss Golding back in primary school and stuff. And they have to say that Miss Golding was, was a, you know, either deluded, um, naive, or otherwise she was in on it and freaking evil. Yeah. And so yeah. you, you have to, all these authority figures and stuff and people that guided them and told them and corrected them, and you, have to, you, you have to say they were all in on it. They, they were all either duped or otherwise you know, basically bought by the system, or but they they completely untrustworthy. Once you start knocking off people that are untrustworthy, you where do you stop? You have, you, you have mm. to cut the head off, you know, the beast of everybody you know. I so, think you so they day, they know that very well. You said one day that people who were you were you th you thought that people who had been quite traumatized by these sort of things were more more able to see this. You, you, in one of our conversations, I don't know, was it on a one-to-one -one conversation or was it yeah, in the group? But you said that a few times that people who have personally experienced this kind of thing and have realized, got out of it, are much more able to see what's going on and and get out of this sort of yeah, but, yeah, yeah, if, 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 yeah, because if um. You can actually push somebody too far until basically if they if they really get hurt. You see, the a lot of the reason why the liberals go along with this is is because they're complicit. The the liberals are very, very evil. And the, the reason why they're evil is they kind of like in a dysfunctional family, but they kind of like the favorite kid. So they they're not getting the abuse. They know the abuse is happening. But um, they turn a blind eye to it because of their privileged position. So they're like the house slaves that pretend that it's not really a plantation and pretend that, you know, people are not being raped on the plantation and people are not being whipped and abused and stuff. So they, they, you can see in them that they're very, very nice. Um, but when you confront them with the truth of, say, you know, what Britain did in Kenya or something, they know and they turn away. They, they know that they're lying. They know that they're covering up evil. And they'll do a certain kind of, you know, bit of um, soul cleansing. So they'll do a bit of activism and, you know, a bit of outrage at the government, uh, you know, doing this or that. Yeah, but, yeah, you know, things against, say, anti-Iraq. And then say, you know, they lie, you know, they lied, we died kind of thing. They'll do a little bit of that just to cleanse their conscience. But on the whole, they they will stop short of staring the beast in the face, and that's uh, and and the the leadership knows that. Then they strengthen the middle class because it's a buffer against the really suffering people, and and so yeah. If the, so if the middle what happens class the... ever get hollowed out, they're in trouble. Yeah, but what happens in the in the case that? Well, what you've just said, Chris Hedges talks about quite a lot, where you where the middle class is is being hollowed out deliberately, so they they now don't have the house. They're going to be the house slaves' privileges aren't going to be available to them anymore. So it's just a dangerous little game that they're playing, where they could be fomenting. It's incredibly mm, mm. You see that. That's why I say this, this is a golden opportunity. If they have stagflation and they, if they have hyperinflation, there'll be nothing left of the middle class. So what anybody that has property, um, say, say you have a big mortgage and you have a secure income, you, you're laughing in hyperinflation because your house is worth more and more. And if you have a source of income, you can pay your mortgage off. So uh, they can buy the middle class um, uh, if they, you know, homeowners. But uh, it's a it's a very dangerous game because if they if you lose your um, your income or something if you fall off the ladder 
during hyperinflation or something, you're in deep trouble. You'll go straight to the bottom, you know, like snakes and ladders. So, so they, so the the middle class property owners will become more and more gun toting, you know, uh, siding with the the establishment. Yeah, but but if you but um, uh, but their number will shrink. And and they they're useless, right? The the middle class is is only good while you know holding um, the system together. So they're only good for social cohesion. If if there's unrest on the street, they're irrelevant. People in the suburbs are re irrelevant. It doesn't matter what they think. The voting system is already hacked to oblivion. So you know, voting doesn't matter. So so what what's the point? of having this buffer between you and the, the suffering classes it doesn't doesn't help you and so that's that's uh, that's the problem that they face it's, it, they they really are straddling a tightrope trying to you know trying to do this great reset um, and yeah it, it's it I wish I could convince people like um, you know rebels and stuff who think you have to get to the the middle class and the the silent majority and all of those because you know they're going to vote and change the government. <laughs> so I say, well, yeah, in the normal liberal democracy, but if if we're talking about extreme times, then the only thing that knocks the middle class out is if you go to war and have a draft. They'll rebel against that. The other thing they'll rebel against that is the younger generation. They don't have a house, and so if if uh, college is not a formula and they get drafted, they, they're going to really rebel. Because if, you see, I think that uh, war is likely to be a real meat grinder war. Because no, nobody would, would have, you know, like I've said, nobody's going to give America the war at once, which is a highly technical war that's three days long. <laughs> it's like, they want to do the Gulf War again, right? Because they're like, nobody's going to give them the Gulf War again. They're going to try and drag them into a, an Af Afghanistan and stuff like that again and try and wear them down. So they're going to try and get them into a quagmire. And if the quagmire gets deep enough and trouble brews at home, enough trouble brews at home, it's very good to have a draft. If you take all the people below 27, you just have to keep everybody that's younger than 27 occupied. That's all they have to do to stop a revolution. So you uh, you can do that now by doing, you know, psyops and stuff like Extinction Rebellion and Fridays for Future. Where you just distract the youth and you, <clears throat> you divert the rebellious spirit into useless crap, which they've done very, very successfully. But that only goes so far. And that, that, that's not going to last... To when people start, uh, you know, protesting a draft, because um, you know they they know they, there's there's blood at the other end of that little plane journey to some hellhole, and so then they're gonna fight really really hard. They're not gonna, you know, all this fetishization of nonviolence will quickly go out of the window with um, a rebellion against the draft. So if you if you take food problems, if you take a financial reset and uh, an intractable quagmire of a war somewhere, then the establishment's in real trouble. Then they have to keep control, you know, just with a big stick. And that's what, that's what they're gearing up for. You can see it all over that they're militarizing the police and they, um, they setting up the legal frameworks for really draconian kind of clampdowns on uh, civil unrest. And they uh, getting you know all these weapons to use against the civilian population, so they they clearly are going to really knuckle down um, on people. But in again in America, they they're in deep trouble because of Second Amendment. Is America is so heavily armed that they you know to to really clamp down on the on the American population is going to be pretty damn difficult. <laughs> well, you in that see all these scenarios, which we're so with, so uh, when it if it comes to a crunch like that, if it comes to a crunch like that, uh, where you know the uh, there's so much civilian firepower, um, 
because I'm sort of, you know, comparing to other countries where the, the civilian population is not armed at all, um, uh, that in a certain sense the, a, a, a sort of rebellion there could... Uh, I'm kind of lost the thread of what I was going to say, but it could be an inspiration for people in other countries who aren't, who aren't, uh, who don't feel as empowered as the Americans are with their guns and their wardrobe and this kind of thing. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. So most most countries disarm their civilian populations by just making draconian laws against gun ownership, and so you know, just say, oh, you'll do fifty years in jail if you're caught with a weapon. And then that normally dis dis you know it's kind of like in Britain that, that completely disarmed the population in Britain when they did that in the eighties. But it's not so easy in America because of the Second Amendment. That they'll never <clears throat> get a constitutional change, so they're they're in a bit of a sticky spot. <laughs> the, the founding fathers were pretty devious to put the Second Amendment in because because. Um, it, it's it's not easy to clamp down with what they intended that you can't easily hold the the population down by force and you can't um, you can't easily disarm them either and so yeah America's in a unique position I mean somewhere it's like like gigantic. Britain and stuff is is basically everybody's to, to the slaughter right but it's also a gigantic market like it it's a it's a it's a big business in the states. The arm, armories, the shops that sell weapons, everything, it's just, it, it has, a, it's, a, it's an extremely uh, good business. Like, you've got enormous forces there, too. It's not just, you know, the Second Amendment and, the, you know, the whole thing. You're, you've got the economical thing, too. It's, it's enormous. Yeah, I remember when, um, yeah, uh, I, I had a, a, a just a, a small window into that personally because, um, uh, my father was a great white hunter uh, in Australia and uh, uh, when I was younger and uh, quite a good friend of his was a, uh, a gunsmith. Um, I mean, a, a real skilled craftsman. You know, he, he would make gun stocks, beautifully crafted timber work and everything like that and turn rifle barrels, all, all this kind of thing. He, 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 he would produce, like, high-quality works of art, basically. Um, and uh, he, they, he just lived quite close by. And I remember uh, at that time, it was probably during the late 70s in Australia where they uh, were going to introduce the restrictions on gun ownership. And, of course, it was going to put this fellow completely out of business, totally, because the, it was just, you know, obviously shutting down his little industry and, and a lot of other people's as well. Um, but the thing that was... Uh, the two things I think that stuck in my mind well, of course, his personal rage against all this, but also the fact that it just was just introduced with really, it was indefensible. Nobody could say a word against it uh, because if you said a word against it, then you were in favour of murderers and, and, you know, all sorts of, uh, you know, you in other words, you, you were part of the problem, not the solution. You, you you couldn't defend it on any grounds whatsoever. They, they, it, they were even where they said, well, like uh, clay pigeon shooters and this kind of thing, you know, uh, was still uh, very, very difficult to defend. I mean, the whole thing just, just sort of shriveled up in, in, in a kind of a, uh, a, a shameful cringe, really. Um, well, they were, they were clever and, uh, in France. They were clever in France when that happened. The same sort of thing, where you know, all European countries are, have have had this after World War Two, where they they kind of tried to control gun ownership. They developed an enormous lobby with the hunters, and the hunters' lobby in France is is even politicians have to be careful where they thread with them. Their rights of hunting, you know, there's a lot of forest and there's a lot of so there are in every every part of the country, in every little county, every mayor, every and politician. And so there's an enormous amount of, of weapons owned by the so-called hunters who sometimes don't hunt, but they're part of those groups, you know, and that, that's how they've got around this gun ownership. And there are a lot of guns in France, but they are in the hands of people who are supposed to go and they're controlled, they have to pay. They have to pay a permit. They have to uh, declare their weapons. No, so, 
So well, people think that we know how many weapons they are, but you know, but that that's how they got around it. It's it's um it's quite clever. Well, yeah. The, this uh, there are a number of game changes now, and that's one of the things is that you know you can do three D printing and technology and stuff allows people. If, say, people in Britain suddenly wanted to, to arm themselves and the situation got to a point where they didn't care about, you know, draconian regulations against gun ownership, there, there are a lot of ways you can get, um, you know, weapons these days that are ghost guns and things like that. But the, um, I think in terms of uh, the danger to the state is it's, it's a completely different landscape now because the biggest threat is digital so the if uh where they're vulnerable is online it's the whole digital world and you know this whole thing about cyber polygon and stuff is they realize that <clears throat> that if they're not um in danger in the old way where people with guns would you know kind of take their local state house or something they they're vulnerable on that their whole fragile economy can come unstuck with cyber warfare, and so the this, the whole thing has moved into this new arena. And you don't really need guns anymore to to actually bring down a state. In in fact, they they are liability. So you know the the, the cyber war is has already started you know in a big way, but it's all state actors now. But they but they you know. There are lots and lots of groups that, you know, for starters, all the states have been so into cyber warfare now for, for you know, since 2008, really. And so they, well, maybe 2006, I think, is when they really started in a big way. But, but this, you see, what the state always forgets is that the guys that you train and have on your side, on not necessarily always going to be loyal to you so a lot of the people that come out of these things that that are retired people or people that leave the military and stuff they, they have all these skills and they can form their own rebel groups so the state runs into the, the problem that they train up all these guys like unit 8200 in israel you don't know what those guys do afterwards if if those guys then turn against the state they they know all the stuff. They've got all the tools and stuff, and so the state's vulnerable from a number of angles. But I think that the biggest vulnerability is is uh, on in cyber warfare and, and the internet. But then you know we, the the way to actually attack them there is with an alternate reality game. So yeah, I mean I, I think it's a, such a big opportunity. <laughs> it's just. I, I just uh, wish, uh, you know, we could just make more traction with it. But I, I feel I'm, I, I'm heading very much for a, you know, oh God, uh, you know, I saw it coming and <laughs> just couldn't, you know, I'm going to be very disappointed that this opportunity has been lost. What, what do you mean? Do you mean because of, you, because of the, the delays with faulty or is it because there's other because i i try to understand what you what yeah 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 i mean in general it's just just such hard work um to people just can't see <laughs> can't see it the way, no, the I, way I, I see it yeah so it, it's <laughs> yeah well did it, you make the progress to get Spencer McCall again or some other guys who are involved in. I can, in, um, if there's nobody waiting, yeah, I think it's time to bring, might be time to bring Spencer back. Hmm. Just wanted to give it some time. But, but, and Jordy, Jordy Aiken, did, did Jordy yeah, Aiken ask? He, he's missing again. I mean, never responded, so, hmm. yeah. So. But, but but what are the major, what are the major I mean I, I don't you see I, I'm really I mean I'm completely a beginner and trying to understand all these things you've been on that for years and you've got a you you've got a brain for that and I don't but your your frustration what is it directed at exactly is it is it amount of uh, the, 
it's just the thing. The thing is, that, like, it just seems. Uh, I'm just a little bit disappointed. Things like, like Allison, she, you see, the way, I see it exactly the same way she sees it. It's basically, there's this. It's it's kind of like a force of nature. This digital thing. It's it's much more than just, you know, transhumanism and stuff. It it is a fun fundamental you know kind of metaphysics um and and it is a showdown between you know team human and all these trans humans so it's so frustrating that everybody gets a little sliver of it and then you find somebody like allison who, who completely gets it and then she goes but i'm all about peace and dandelions and it's like it seems like everybody that can get it gets some piece of it and then they just the rest it just falls through the fingers and stuff and that's that it's very frustrating not not being able to you know you know you get so many that like can do the arg part but then they have no interest in <clears throat> in activism or rebellion or something and then you get the the rebel thing and then they but no about the other side about the arg side and you know it's like you, it's just just can't get uh get it together so that everybody has all the pieces in it. They're like, oh right, <laughs> got it, you know. Yeah, but Every, it's those, like everybody has a piece it together. But do those people have to be really in the you see in the know if if you can try to I don't know, make filling gaps and making connections. Um I, I, I find it hard to express what I mean, but there's all these interesting people who know a lot of things who can can, can they do, they don't have to be completely all involved in you know maybe maybe we went too much to Alison we, we, went, we went too much frontal and we didn't kind of many maybe maneuver a bit and try to, to to get her from a different point of view you see I don't know I was trying to see why what what made her yeah. turn away from us and I think it might have been this where we were we were up front with who we are what we think what we want to do and maybe we should have just said well we want to discuss uh, AI and uh, control, and you know, and we're not. And, and we went. I, I was it me. I, I would get the emails, and maybe I, 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 with your help, enormous. But maybe we we said too much about us, <laughs> you know, that we we well, did. She found out. She found out. She, on her own. I mean, what, out. she no. Well, the tripping point for her is is tricking people for their own good. So it's the it's the ethical thing of of you know basically uh, yeah but it's <clears throat> it's you know it's entirely unrealistic to think you, you can spell it all out you know and for people and give them a brochure of you know, yeah. what, what it's going to be like it's like, like you just, it's just you know, maybe we should. It, it was a child's point though I mean you know I made a reply under that one of her little videos pointing out. That the obvious refutation of that argument is anyone who's a parent. You 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 know you've got to you, at some stage. You, the only way you're going to get a kid to do something for its own good is you've got to con it, trick it, lie to it, do whatever it's going to take. Then after you've done that, uh, the, the child will see for itself that the value of of what you've got to do it, it'll be okay from that point on. But you, there's no way you're going to get that result. Without uh, you know, without doing this dreadful unethical thing that she's going on about, um, and you know, really, you could say, oh, well, that's all right in the case of children, you know, blah blah blah. But you know, we live in a highly infantilized society. Um, to, but anyway, you know, obviously, I didn't cut any mustard with her. Um, yeah, you're going to ask, but, but, but it, it's I, kind of like a package deal, is. You, to, to actually get the whole picture, you've got to think in terms of doomerism. So you, you, you have to think that, you know, kind of Guy mcpherson -y, that we are in near at risk of near-term extinction. So a lot of people don't think we are in much peril. And so the people that, that get that, then they, they like Sam Mitchell and stuff, and then they all like defeated and nihilistic and everything, and they don't want to do anything. And so, uh, and then, you know, the people, and then they don't understand the technical side and all of that. And then, you know, you get Alison who completely gets the technical side, but she's never heard about 
climate change or tumorism. She, she thinks we've got 10,000 years to deal with these guys. And so, and so I, I but just the feel interesting like thing is right? that, you, you know, like if you look at Alison, though, she, she's capable of entertaining what, what most people think of pretty woo woo ideas, all, all her, you know, subtle energies and, 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 and sort of, uh, you know, native mystical stuff going on, which is pretty far out there for, for, for most people. And yet she, but she can hang out off the edge of the boat in that direction. But if you take her over to the other side of the boat, she won't hang out in the other direction to, to, to the same degree. So you've got very selective um, transgression of, of accepted boundaries there. There's a real kind of sort of, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, brick walls being assembled. I'll, I'll have this kind of, of um, I'll have this kind of a, 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 a esotericism, but not that kind, you know, is too much. Um, there's no logic to it, right? There's no logic. I mean, so, yeah, that's so it. Yeah. Uh, no, she's, she's not going to go and ask people, you know, hey, is it okay <laughs> if I exude this positive energy and transform the whole world? And so, you know, she's oh, going to well, do that without yeah, anybody's yeah, consent. Yeah, but then it was like, yeah, yeah but, you know. Uh, why 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 are you allowed to do that but you're not allowed to do something that might practically work and actually change the world and like well i think what it really is is she doesn't really want to change the world she wants eco she's got eco anxiety but i think most people are on that they're just working from a kind of pleasure principle and so they you know they, anybody that's has a bit of eco anxiety they want a bit want something to do to alleviate that there are very few people that that want to you know, actually do something <laughs> for the world. That's, that's connected uh, to the denial of death. That, that's connected to the denial of death. I think it has the same roots and the same kind of. Thing. Oh, it's a good. Yeah, but it, it's it's selfish. Well, they they just thinking of themselves. There are very few people that think in a bigger. You know, like the that really are thinking about nature and the world and the, But do you, you need know, a, do, people, do, do, do we need a lot you know, of people on board to start this arc? Yeah, it's you see, it's it's trying to get it launched is is difficult. But the way these things work is it's uh, okay. So this is this the way you bootstrap uh, any kind of. Enterprise is, is the same way you do this, and the, so this is called crossing the chasm. Is the is the big thing? So crossing the chasm is very difficult uh, thing to do. You, as an entrepreneur bootstrapping a company, you have to beg, borrow, and steal, and cajole, and get people together, and things fall upon. You've got to do a lot of herding cats. But the the way you get across the chasm is just you get enough together that you know something clicks and then when something clicks you cross the chasm and then what well, they say you're in, into the tornado so the whole thing changes suddenly it takes off and uh, you know it, it it goes kind of viral and then just goes nuts and then you have to kind of change everything you do it kind of has to switch the the opposite way in a lot of ways it's kind of like going through the the sound barrier, you know, like in the old days, they used to, everybody used to think, oh, well, you know, when you go through the sound barrier, you have to reverse the controls because there was a movie that <laughs> during, during Chuck Yeager's time that was that that had that. And so, yeah, when I was a kid, everybody believed that when reverse the on the plane. But but anyway, it's kind of like that. Is you you go through the sound barrier and then the rules flip and you have to reverse the controls in, in, in a way. But mo most entrepreneurs can't survive crossing the chasm because they, they, don't, they don't know and they can't. <laughs> they don't know that the rules are different inside the tornado. But yeah, this is basically what you have to do. You just pe peck away and just try and get people involved and stuff and just, um, it's, so as, yeah, as an entrepreneur, you Pitching, pitching ideas, but you need you need money. You need some famous person, or you need money, or something. It's something uh, to to initiate it. Um, you you can't just it doesn't just happen where because everybody gets together and think, <laughs> thinks it's a great idea. 
uh, you, you need well, a thank you. I don't understand little... anything about this. So, I mean, I'm just like listening to what you're saying is foreign language and I'm learning. Thank you. Because I just no idea of logistics there. So, mm. as a follow up, yeah, to here. Oh, as a follow up to Sophie's question, um, would, would the value then that Allison would have brought to the ARG is her is her um, popularity or her audience? Because if if we if, if you already are, you know, you have the same understanding of where AI and transhumanism are taking us, and we we read, we listen to her, so we we would get the information from her and an understanding. What additional value would she have brought to the ARG? Would it be her following, her popularity, her um, her connections? No, no, it's really no, it's it's really sales, right? So it's uh, you know, so you you're trying to get a winning team together, and so each person in the team has the expertise. So so. The it's really for sales, so that she completely understands the space and the research, and she's very convincing on on that. So if if you say, well, you know, well, the narrative, the the easy narrative for the ARG is what we came in on is you just say it's a very easy, rebellious, so basically cross cutting uh, narrative that appeals across the board to people is you know team human against the transhumanists. She understands the transhumanists well, and so she's great for selling that idea. So anybody you know that's famous or has money to invest or something like that, uh, she can quickly explain you know all that stuff credibly, um, explain the the, the narrative, um, and so you need all those kind of people. So you you put all the the pieces together. So each person brings something that is, is uh, a piece of the, the overall package. Then, so we, if you, you're normally pitching to, you know, people, say like investors, right? So for seed capital or something like that. And what you, you know, they, they test you on what, where the gaps are. They wanna see what the gaps are. And so they test your story and like, okay. But then if you have some glaring hole where you, you say, well, yeah, we have, this fabulous idea for nanotechnology, you know, but yeah, we don't, we don't have anybody on the team that actually is a biochemist. A small flaw, which we'll fix later. They will tell you to fuck off and fix that before they'll look yeah. at you. So, so it's the it's the same. If if you say you know this, we have an arg, this is the narrative for the thing and the, the whole thing. As I, as I wrote in that document, faulty. Um, then you know if faulty would be the kind of uh, you know, uh, the front man. That would be, yeah, well, well, I mean, he, he, in this scenario, he'd be playing the role of like a venture capitalist. What should do is ask questions of like where there's a hole here, a hole here, and then you know, we 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 have a we can fill the hole of of that whole thing about the transhumanists, but she's got it down pat. Yeah, so she's she, a you know, she could expert. Anybody. She would, she would do it, yeah. yeah. So, so even if she just played the role as a, we, we only asked her to play the role as an expert. We never asked her to get involved in that. <laughs> she just didn't want her on principle that we weren't weren't aligned with her thinking. And I don't know how we can get aligned on her thinking. Oh, it's like, like mm -hmm. some battles. What the hell do that? Yeah, but, by, by but how does that we would be detrimental to her image? She obviously said that we would. We wouldn't. We, it wouldn't fit. Yeah, but fit we, we, we said it was confidential. We're not the sort of people to to associate with, more or less. You would say, you know. You know well, <laughs> but, nobody would. I mean, I have to agree with her on that point. But, but the thing was, is that it could be confidential, right? He said, yeah, we weren't going to make it public, right? But what I mean, would the whole thing? I thought all the way down the road is nobody. I always took it as read that everybody understands that we're not going to make this public. <laughs> Right. So it's a predicament. Um, so probably there are no solutions. But what what are her solutions to what she sees as this? Um, I asked the problem the of transhumanism and AI. 
I asked her the same question. She never answered. I sent a following email say, what is your form of activism? What do you propose? No answer. Maybe it's that mystical thing. No, she of, said it's uh, peace and daffodils. She says, I offer peace and daffodils. It, it is. It's all her use of subtle energies to influence proceedings, you know. Um, the point is she's not dealing with, she's dealing with people, she's trying to influence people who are more machine-like than human, and so it's not really susceptible to the kind of approach that she's, she has, I don't think she's realised that. Um, Hugh, can I go, I want to just bring up two things. Uh one was, uh, you know, you were mentioning the the internet, the end of the open internet, um, and so that's also an increased reason for wanting to establish the ARGs so that they are within particular countries um, and can operate independently, I guess. Uh, is that too far ahead for you to have thought about at this stage? Yeah. No, that, that's, you that's know, right. Like, what, you see, a, a secret society. Yeah, a, a secret society can can cross borders. That's that's the value. So, the the national borders are big liability for the state, um, and that's one of the reasons why Klaus Schwab and all these globalists want to get rid of national borders because they uh, they allow something like a secret society to to operate. So, the, like the Falun Gong or something mm. like that, if it's cross-border thing, and these things are, um, they, you know, you can always find safe haven in, a, in, in some place like Iceland or somewhere that doesn't, yeah. um, doesn't really uh, go after these people because they're not really threatened by them. And then uh, it's, it's very difficult for the state to get you. See, like, like Assange is, is happening now. Um, but, the, uh, uh, but here's what's happening to the internet. The internet is, is becoming balkanized. So, what mm. each one of these countries is doing is they're trying to get control. It's the end of the open internet, but there's the bamboo curtain and there'll be an iron curtain around Russia and everybody needs to be able to switch off the, the other uh, ones, public yeah. internet. Because, because what, what happened in the, with the Arab Spring was there was too much organization going on. They, they, all the states learned that a lot of the stuff was organized on things like Facebook. So they can only go so far, you know, they can get Facebook on board with basically shutting the stuff down, and that's what they're doing. They're doing a practice run now with all the, the pandemic. But they really need to shut down the, the Internet. So what happened in the wake of the Arab Spring is every tin pot dictator made sure that they controlled all the servers. And everything is, is based on the DNS, right, the domain name servers. So... So what's coming is DNS sec, and so they will have secured DNS. So you, you know, they will control whether the the DNS uh, server is actually the correct one because you know it will be authenticated with DNS sec, and so it's it's very controlled and restricted. So when Klaus Schwab keeps on going on about um, you know the, this collaboration and you know. Uh, across states in the digital realm and all this stuff. It's, it's code, and what they're talking about is is, may, is uh, really control of the DNS server so you have, um, you know, multi-factor authentication and stuff like that. But what that means is that whoever the entities are, they, they will be known to the government, and then they will the government will kind of allow that transaction to happen. It's not as overt as the government, it will be done through proxies and basically through chains of authority and things like that and certification, of, uh, you know, chains and stuff like that. But, but it'll, you know, now you can you can go to a domain and you you know just use TLS and the you you can talk to um, a website and it's just between you as the user and the the website and then that traffic is it's just between those two parties in effect. All the other parties in between, like your your web, um, you know, basically whoever provides you with your web service provider, all these kind of intermediates, it's completely transparent to them. So things have changed a bit, and so that they the law changed so they could shape the data and give different classes of service. But it'll be much more much different. So it'll be more like 
who are you? Are you allowed to talk to this person? You must, you know, have a full identity and it would be a global identity. So before you go and transact, say, bought something on Amazon, you would have to go and authenticate, a, you know, get a universal identity, prove it's actually you, prove that the, you know, that the, 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 the buyer or where the website you're going to is actually a legitimate service. And in effect, what they're trying to do is to, is to shut down any illicit activity on the web. So, so they will get to a point where you can't have anything other than a, a preferred chat server and stuff like that. So if you have four channels, I mean, they will shut you down in a heartbeat uh, because you just won't be able to find the servers. It's exactly what they did to Iran, right? So they, Iran, they, they took over all their, their websites a couple of weeks ago. Okay. And what the way they do that is they, they don't take down the websites. They just take down the, the name server so you can't find <laughs> the servers. They just redirect you. To, to so so you know your traffic traffic redirects and stuff will go to safe places and it's it's all very safe and secure because you know they have a trusted intermediary and and uh, so so it, it's it, it's a, think of it like a traffic system at the moment everybody just makes their own path through through the desert to wherever they get to and what they what what the, they're planning and what's coming down rapidly is that it'll be just like the highway system and it'll be policed and you know you, you will have um, rules of the road that you can only you know, make left turns in this situation you'll have to obey the signpost on it so it'll it'll be policed like a little village now the problem is for the states is that in a balkanized universe uh, it's not so easy to get all the states to comply. So everybody will have their own little piece locked down. So China is already, you know, completely controlled experience in the in the controlled uh, web that they've got. But if if you imagine things like uh, the Tor network and the dark web, which is the vast majority of things, if people make parallel protocols, they don't use your name server and the you know that kind of thing. They, they run the risk that people make their own system in parallel. Now, th then it's very difficult because uh, you, you, that would be a, sort of like equivalent to VPNs and stuff all over the world. And so what, what it would be was the state would struggle to shut those, those things down. They would struggle to recognize them and struggle to police them. So in, on, the, on the road to this Orwellian nightmare, where every transaction is done with blockchain, there's just e-cash. Um, and so everything is micro-controlled. You won't be able to do a transaction that's illegal. It's kind of like 1984, where they edited the language, they changed the language so you couldn't do a thought crime because you just didn't have the, the language ability to do a thought crime. It's the same kind of thing. You won't be able to do uh, any kind of thought crime on the internet because they you they won't give you the 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 tools to to be to do it so in other words it's already on reddit right you, you can't actually use a number of keywords because they just auto delete and so the same thing if you tried to buy drugs or something that transaction would be auto deleted before you even started so it's uh, so it's uh, and the same would be rebellion so then you couldn't rebel you couldn't do a secret society because you know basically you wouldn't there wouldn't be any way that you could, you know, basically AI would look at what you're crafting in terms of the message and say, oh, this is illicit, and you wouldn't be able to post it. You know, kind of like, but it's all a bit retarded because, you know, just like uh, these guys are very linear thinking Vogons. So just like you can see on, on Reddit, well, we easily get around all the keywords just by substituting in little Greek symbols and stuff. It's as easy as pie to get around it. But they don't think that way. He's quite, you know, they all rule abiding Vogons. So Klaus Schwab never thinks, well, you know, we're going to do this wonderful, great reset and herd all these people through this. And they're not thinking through, you know, other people can also do that dimwit. So basically, you run the risk <clears throat> that, that there's an entire parallel underground. And basically, you have all these people living uh, on the dark web. And then, then, of course, they say, you know, okay, well, 
anybody found using this bit of software or has a Tor browser or uses Tor gets the death penalty. But it doesn't, it, it just reinforces the underground and makes, um, makes people work harder against the state. So it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity because these guys are so retardedly stupid that they will fuck this up. They will fuck up and they will fuck up balkanization of the internet. Uh, but but the problem is there's nobody taking advantage of it. <laughs> you know, here it is coming. And well, um, nobody. There are lots of people taking advantage. Here, it's a, yeah, can but, I but, just but, jump but, in? Um, that, that yes, I just, go ahead. Yeah, I, I wanted to make this point a little while ago. Is is that, you know, I mean, a lot of what you've been saying tonight is, is sort of expressing the sense of urgency that, um, that, that this is a, a, a period of opportunity to do something. Um, and I just want to, if I can just drag it back, because you haven't heard from Faulty, apparently. Um, and uh, what's your intention there? You're just going to wait for a little while. I, I mean, I'm just wondering whether it, 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 it might be possibly a time to send him a completely different kind of message just on that particular point of do you realise how short the time is that if you don't get in on the ground floor of this opportunity, you're going to miss it completely and just, just it'll be gone forever. I mean, is it, is it worth sending him a little message taking that, that I angle? Maybe, what, what, I think maybe tomorrow, because it's been a week, right? So I think maybe tomorrow, if you don't have anything, then okay. Tuesday, I better send something so you get my last thing. Uh, just, but, I, I don't think it's worthwhile doing that because uh, really, I'm sure the reason why uh, there's been no response is just because he's distracted and busy on other stuff. So it, it doesn't he's, help. He's, he's, he's going to be distracted and busy with other stuff for eternity unless we can get in, in uh, create a sufficient crack in his little world. Yeah. He's just going to go back. It's just so obvious. Yeah. I, I'm look maybe I'm up myself a little bit, but just from from especially one person that I know personally, who has just basically made a fine art of spending her whole life being perpetually too busy with what I'm really devoted to, blah blah blah, to to let anything else get a foot in the door. Um, it, it's just like, oh yes, that's good, but I'm I'm occupied. I've got I've got another mission, blah blah blah, and, and you can see that. I picked that up pretty well immediately with with uh, with faulty. This this, this um, it's pretty well hermetically sealed. Um, you know, you you just you're going to get this eternal deferral, um, and at some stage, maybe we might have to take the risk of completely alienating him, alienating him by putting a much stronger little little explosive device in the doorway to try and push it open a little bit well, the invitation the invitation to go to greece could have an expiry date yeah i'm wondering whether the invitation to, to greece cuts any mustard at all yeah it's not a bad I suggestion think... sophie yeah yeah but anyway yeah, but I, I don't think we can put any pressure on. I mean, I think we're in a previous discussion was correct that basically we just have to go at his own pace and just to leave. So may, uh, may, it, may I ask you? you know, the, the thing is, it's just a question of time. It's well, so just let me finish what I'm saying. The, the, uh, it's a question of timing. And so the timing is when it, he's only going to, I mean, he's semantically sealed and always will be. The only gap you get is when his world falls apart and you realize it's not actually coming together. So, so I thought we were at that point and we got a good response. So it seems, seems, seems right, but now we're off on another wild goose chase. But, but yeah, but for, from, from our point of view, from my point of view, it seems like he's completely wasting his time on this crap. But from, from his point of view, it's all, very useful stuff and <laughs> very important. <laughs> so he doesn't see it our way. So, 
you know, but I think we just have to soft pedal it and just just keep on keep on going until you know we got a good response. So it's just we just wait until yeah we get and a, we never, we get never some air time. We, we never thought we would have him on a on a conversation with us in the first place. Only even a couple of months ago. So at least you know we've achieved that. So it's true. Maybe we have to be patient. But oh. I didn't want to say put pressure on him by saying that there's an expiry date. But do, doing it gently, but saying, well, this can't go on because you have other things. To, you might be going other places and stuff. But you say the journey could take place between this date and that date, and you can pick your date. And do you know that that's what I what I meant by that? And it, it because oh, it, well, there's an expiry <laughs> on this because. The, basically, the, the numbers in Greece are skyrocketing. Ever, yeah. ever since they open up, they open up the lockdown, and the numbers yeah. have taken off like a rocket. Let me let so this is, is you know, it's like the numbers are growing everywhere, but it's the number of cases, but the numbers of deaths and the numbers of hospitalizations are not. The deaths nowhere except the deaths in certain very down. deprived countries. Now it's wait to see in a couple of weeks what's going to happen. But for the moment, it seems like it's the young people who are getting it. And they're not getting sick because all the other guys have been killed or vaccinated. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, but the, I mean, in Israel, the deaths are going up. And are I, they? I think the deaths are going up in Greece. Are yeah. they? Oh, because the last time, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't see. May I, when I just speak, do you yeah, know you were it, talking about the web before? And I, I have something on my mind. You've posted couple of videos there about this guy explaining about the difference between the web the internet the deep web the dark web and i i've listened to that carefully so apparently from what he was saying the deep web is much 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 more important than the web and actually that google cannot go to the, the huge majority of places on the internet is that right did i get it right the deep yeah. web talks yeah. about yeah, everything yeah. that's protected no, by passwords I've said before the, the dark web. <coughs> no, but the, deep web. <laughs> the dark web is like ninety percent of the web. There's far more to the web than you can actually access. But yeah, the, yeah well, the Google web. has the web crawlers. They, my 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 question is so, about the web. Oh, okay, so the, the deep web is just things that are not addressable by Google. So don't, you find machines because you do domain name lookups and so google only follows links in in web pages and um and basically trawls you know domains so uh it can only find things from other things and so it's it's just the public layer on top that people want to display from web servers but the vast majority of machines are not web servers and they don't want you to access them they, they data servers and stuff like that, but they, they, they. Um, a lot of the stuff is is B two B. A lot of the traffic is B two B and private, and so, yeah. And the, the 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 dark web is the little corner where all the illegal shit goes. <laughs> but and but yeah, I mean, a lot of the traffic in on the web is is military and shit like that, and so uh, that you know the. They don't, want, uh, you know, they don't want all that stuff public, but it, it just means that you, you it's not addressable, right? So you you can't search for it. But the 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 servers are there. I mean, if you if you write a program that just goes through all the IP addresses and pings them, you'll find that the servers there, and that that's what that's what these guys do. They they ping them and interrogate them and figure out what the you know the operating system is and see what ports are open and then they start hacking around and then you know try and try and get get in that way that's how that that stuff if if you if you put a server up on the on the dark web or uh it'll be pinged at a rate of about one second by by basically guys trolling for <laughs> basically malicious about a rate of one second. So basically you'll go, bing, bing, you'll get these uh, illegal accesses about that rate. So it's a tremendous amount of traffic going on that's malicious. And, uh, you know, so a lot of 
you, you see, one of the reasons why there are no chips on the market is because they're, they're backdoors in everything. And so, and nobody really knows how many backdoors they're in. And, you know, they keep on finding these zero day attacks that really they're embedded and they're all like sleeper things. So they don't know how many uh, servers are actually compromised. So come, you know, World War Three, day one of World War Three, everybody's going to find out because everybody's going <laughs> to activate all the their Trojan horses and stuff on all these machines. So what uh, what the, these teams have done? If you go on the dark web, one of the things you can buy is compromised servers. They sell them in bulk. Your 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 machine, the machine that you got right now could be compromised and people could be trading your IP address on, on the dark web. And, and so they have all these bots that are, you know, kind of sleeping on, on these servers. So when, when World War Three starts, those bots are going to come alive and they, they're going to be attacking all these vectors. They're going to be attacking government servers and military installations and stuff. So the military needs to be able to shut down, you know, vast, pieces of the web and, and shape the traffic and stuff at, at the nodes on the internet. But yeah, it's it's gonna be a it's gonna be a complete fandango on day one of World War World War Three. That's what they're Thank prepping you. for. They all trying to get you. clean chip chipsets, they all kind of get yeah. But but yeah the the internet is isn't gonna stand a chance. I mean uh, well for for I mean it's gonna stay up in a war but it, it's it's going to be a battlefield. So, so you know, it, civilian use is going to disappear. And it's really a military thing. The internet is a, you've got to think of the internet as a military thing that they're just allowing you to use out, out of the kindness of their hearts just so that you, you keep on supporting it and support all the, the money spent. But as, as, as soon as there's major wars or something like that, you, you can expect the, your cell phone won't work anymore and stuff. They, they made a big fuck up during 9-11 uh, and they didn't realize that that everybody would phone their mom. So all these Cold War systems and that were, that were set up for for this resilience in these, you know, the, the Internet itself was is built with a lot of redundancy. And that was the reason was to survive nuclear attacks. Now, what they didn't realize was that the if there were was a nuclear attack, then the internet would be unusable quickly because everybody would start phoning their mom. And that's what happened in 9-11 is none of the systems in the government that everybody was supposed to use the internet. They couldn't stop all the civilian use of it. So it was completely overloaded and it became dysfunctional. I think, I think Bush and stuff, I strongly suspect while well, he was flying around in air force one, he was completely incommunicado because everything was overloaded. Strongly suspect that. Did Thank everybody you. disappear? No. <laughs> but, so, so I, I lost everybody's picture. So you're contacting Faulty. I've, I've lost. You're contacting Faulty on next week again. Oh, oh well, I'll do it on like Tuesday if we don't hear anything. Yeah. And uh, is there anything? I'll just just ping. Just ping. What's that? Is there anything in the line of people that are like Alison? Because to find somebody who matches her, it's quite difficult. But um, I know but in terms of the way she explains things, I'm not talking about her, her methods. Um, but is there anybody that around her that we could start sort of investigating that could fill her, um, her void, the void that, she, you know, the place she could have she could have had in our plan that would be good to, to look for people yeah. just just people that understand the you know the great reset and stuff like that yeah, yeah i i thought i thought uh, dimitri would be good on that score but i was rather surprised that like so like oh, we'll never come to anything what <laughs> are you kidding me <laughs> You think these guys are just playing snooker? I mean, come on, this is not a tea party. This is a the, 
those guys that were coming out of Davos are going to reshape the world. It's not a question. <laughs> like, I know a collective who's working a lot on transhumanism in France, and they're they're a very rebellious group, and they've even done actions when meeting, but, but they're all French speakers, and it would, and I don't think they have very good English. I don't. It would be a very difficult if you want to collaborate with people in another language. It can be difficult, and especially if we're going to have conversations like this. Mm. But I could look at what they're doing at the moment, but. Uh, I, well, the, the very thing, good. I think a more fruitful, I, th I think probably a more fruitful avenue might be the guys around Uncle Ted. So the, there are lots of guys that are in the orbit around Uncle Ted. Yeah, but the, those guys are a bit like that. They're a collective that's extremely underground, and they, they, um, they, uh, I. I'm going to. I'll, try, I'll, post something about them. I'll post something about them, and you tell me what you, all of you think. Yeah, sure. But the the no the the thing that I posted about the ITS guys and stuff. Yeah. Those guys oh, are yeah. public. Oh yeah, that's different. That's another. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, but I know they they were talking about. You know, that that guy that was interviewed on that thing was was um, you know anti was, anti -serve. yeah that was anti tech basic anti tech. We're not talking about um, people who are an expertise in the Great Reset and transhumanism who would have more. It's what you're talking about. Maybe digging into people who have a much more <laughs> an understanding that is more radical. <laughs> I'm sure that this. I mean. I'm sure the guys in the neck of the woods that understand the Great Reset, because I mean everybody, everybody on the on the right understands the Great Reset. <laughs> it is the big conspiracy. Maybe some friends of Kevin. <laughs> yeah, but th those guys are all a bit lowbrow. I mean, they're either doctors and stuff, or otherwise a bit Brubaker Arms or something. It's a little bit lowbrow. But Sophie, uh, yeah. um, would, an, would an option be to uh, to uh, just start commenting under Alison's videos as somebody, not you, just just uh, mm -hmm. take on another identity. Uh, and just uh, ask innocent questions like, you know, are there any other people who are putting out a message like Allison's? I'm interested in this stuff. I want to follow it up. Um, you know, are there, are there other other people who agree and who are taking a similar line? So you might find somebody else that way. Use the other commenters as your sort of um, uh, group of people to make suggestions. You, you might have somebody pop up and say, oh, yeah, so-and-so down there uh, has got a, um, you know, a website or a blog, and they're saying almost the same things that Alison is. And then, you know, you might be able to find somebody else who's taking a similar line, but who, who is, uh, who, mm -hmm. you know, they might be interested in talking to us, whereas Alison isn't. So it just might be just a way of uncovering somebody. I wouldn't really need to change my name because it doesn't matter because I wouldn't be interacting with her, really. I could just, but yeah. my name on the, my name on the YouTube is the same name as on the meetings and the same as on the, the Proton mail, <laughs> so it doesn't matter. I, could, it's yeah. a, I think, it, yeah, I could do that yeah. um, because then somebody might, might reply. Thank you. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm, just, uh, I'm just thinking back to early days when I first discovered the Doom atmosphere and uh it was every now and then that would happen where somebody would pop up in the comments and say oh hey you know i'm really interested in this are there other people who, who are putting out a similar message and you would immediately get other commenters provide you with a list of fascinating links to to all sorts that they'd, they'd be very happy to 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 share their uh their you know knowledge of who else is out there uh and you know almost invariably you would discover um a new opening, you know, somebody else who who was uh, who was talking in a similar manner, but you know, had a, had a different slant on it and, and this kind of thing. Um, so Thank you for that, could, Gary. Uh, I will do that this week. 
So another thing might be to look on Reddit. I haven't looked on Reddit if there's like, there must be a Klaus Schwab or, you know, like a Klaus Schwab or something like that. It must be a, a sub for conspiracies about the Great Reset. I is anybody, seen one, but I haven't really to, is any going to, anybody going to miss Guy McPherson? <laughs> <laughs> I stopped following him. But. I know. <laughs> for, I mean, for about two years, I think I couldn't watch yeah. him. But I, you posted that he was retiring from right. his show um, on Radio. Nature Bats last. Or, yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, I was, oh, I was getting he, a, little, he, a little worried they were all going to drink Kool-Aid after. Oh, I, no. I, I thought they might have a little, you know, Kool-Aid party at the end of the show. I was getting a little worried. <laughs> <laughs> Sounded like they're about yeah. to check out. They, they definitely sound like a bunch that's going to go for the Kool-Aid at some oh, stage. Geez. What are those names I can read in the message? Douglas Roshkov and Jaron Lanier. Yeah, I just uh, oh, popular yeah. computer That's scientists, right. computer professors, but I am not familiar with their total stand on uh, transhumanism and AI. Yeah, let's let's try and find an, another Allison. <laughs> Oh well. So is is that is that does that exhaust this evening? Yeah, we're all dead on it. Yeah. I'm exhausted anyway. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Okay. Well, let let's just pause just for the hell of it, should we? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So just for still. All right. Okay. Well, not a very exciting one, but anyway, maybe next Sunday. Uh, yeah. All right. Bye. Bye. Have a good week. Have a good thanks, week. Thanks, Hugh. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Stop uh, the thank you. Thank you. Thank you.